Due to the graphic nature of these crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of animal abuse and threats of violence. We advise extreme caution for children under the age of 13. Overall, Regina Fogarty liked her new boss, Eric Williams. It had only been four months since he'd been elected a justice of the peace, but so far he seemed nice. More tech-savvy than his predecessor, Eric typed his own reports. Regina appreciated the lighter load. But that beautiful spring morning in 2011, three sheriff's deputies suddenly showed up looking for Judge Williams. Regina asked if they had warrants they needed the judge to sign. One responded, we have one for his arrest. Surely the deputy was only kidding. Regina laughed uneasily and pointed them toward the office. She could hardly believe her eyes when they emerged moments later, dragging the judge out in handcuffs. This week, we'll discuss Eric Williams, a small town boy with a big sense of entitlement. Over time, he became a little too comfortable taking what he wanted, and it cost him everything. Next week, we'll explore the consequences of his actions and the political turmoil that followed. In the aftermath of it all, Eric's rage turned deadly. We have all that and more coming up. Stay with us. By all accounts, Eric Williams had a pleasant, if unremarkable, childhood. Born in 1967 in rural Texas, his parents were hardworking, salt-of-the-earth people. Eric was an easygoing child. He rarely cried or needed attention, fitting right in with his even-keeled family. But there was something that made the family stand out, something they all took great pride in. Most of Eric's male relatives served in the military. His mother's side celebrated Armistice Day, the official end of World War I, every year to commemorate her father's service. Eric's dad was a former Marine and veteran of the Korean War. He was as dedicated to civil service as he was to the military, volunteering during elections and stressing the importance of political action. A man always did his duty in every respect. Responsibility was valued highly in the household. So in 1974, when the Williams family bought a farm in Azle, Texas, seven-year-old Eric was expected to do his fair share especially since his mom became unexpectedly pregnant around the same time. Eric seemed excited to get a new baby sister. He even carried a tiny plastic baby around in his pocket and introduced it to everyone he met. But after the real baby arrived, he barely looked at her. When his grandma tried to get him to interact with little Tara, he was reluctant to hug or hold her. Eric's lack of affection wasn't a red flag at the time. His parents weren't the most emotional people either, so they assumed he came by it naturally. He was still generally a happy, smiley kid. He was smart too. More often than not, Eric could be found with his nose in a book, even or perhaps especially when he was supposed to be doing chores. He spent so much time absorbed in his own imagination that his parents worried he might never make friends. Luckily, Eric found a home with a troop of nerds and outcasts when he started school. Eric himself was a weirdo. He carried a briefcase and wasn't what anyone would call a people person. But among the science geeks and mathletes, he was the top of the pack. He was the first of his friends to get a personal computer, which he was eager to show off. But it was still the 1980s, and most of what Eric truly loved to do was offline. His favorite pastime was Dungeons & Dragons, a role-playing game set in a fantasy world. Eric and his friends spent hours pretending to be knights and wizards, battling dark magic and saving the world. And while he might have been a nerd, he was also a country kid. Eric also enjoyed hiking, camping, and hunting. He was a Cub Scout all through grade school, graduating to the Boy Scouts in his teens. Like nearly everything else, 
Eric took scouts very seriously. By 14, he was in the running to become an Eagle Scout, the highest rank possible. It's such a prestigious achievement that even after completing all the requirements, a scout must also pass a board of review to earn the honor. James Lyons, chief of police in the nearby Springtown, was on Eric's board. He'd been reviewing potential Eagle Scouts for years, but Eric seemed different than the other boys. When asked questions, he just stared back at Lyons. His dark eyes were blank, almost dead. Though the experience left Lyons deeply unsettled, the board still accepted Eric's application. His parents invited 200 people to the ceremony and celebration. The achievement highlighted Eric's stellar reputation. Most people thought of him as a responsible, level-headed, and all-around good kid. Not many saw the other side of his personality, the dark side. His sister, Tara, was one of the few. Whenever their parents were away, Eric tormented her. One day, he killed Tara's pet cat while doing target practice with his BB gun. It might have been brushed off as an accident, except that the poor creature had been shot straight through the eye. It wasn't the last time Eric killed something. He regularly murdered strays. He got a particular thrill from catching the animals off guard and defenseless. Before we get into Eric's psychology, please note, I am not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but we have done a lot of research for the show. These days, animal cruelty is a widely recognized red flag in childhood behavior. A 2001 study by Linda Mers Perez and criminologist Dr. Kathleen Heidi found violent criminals were significantly more likely to commit animal cruelty. Not only that, but their future acts of human violence often resembled their previous ones. For Eric, killing his sister's pet was only the first instance of what would become a fixation. Slaying cats, especially kittens, came with a specific kind of power. The animals had no reason to distrust him and had no way of understanding what was happening before it was too late. Eric wasn't interested in a challenge. He liked looking the kittens in their eyes as he pulled the trigger at point blank range. But not many people outside the family knew about Eric's kitten killing. And soon he found an easy way to channel his worst impulses toward a more acceptable practice. In his rural community, hunting was a socially accepted hobby. As Eric got older, he and his friends would spend weekends hunting other small game in the local woods. Eric might have seemed like just one of the guys, but his friends weren't oblivious. They noticed plenty about him that unnerved them. Like one night, when they were out cruising the country roads, Eric was driving way over the speed limit, all but ignoring every stop sign they passed. When someone called him on it, Eric's response wasn't exactly befitting of an Eagle Scout. He told his friends, it's only illegal if you get caught. He seemed to consider himself above the rules. His intelligence made him feel untouchable. Confident to the point of arrogance, he saw no reason he couldn't do what he wanted when he wanted. He also knew it mattered how people saw him, so he made sure to maintain his stellar reputation all the way through high school. After graduating in 1985, 18-year-old Eric earned a chemistry scholarship to Texas Christian University. He'd always been good at science, but at this point, it was no longer his passion. The older he got, the more Eric grew to love guns. They embodied power and violence in a way that spoke to his soul. Shortly after starting college, Eric enlisted in the campus ROTC. There, he had access to as many firearms as he wanted, but that wasn't all. Soon, he decided to pivot away from chemistry, choosing instead to follow his family's footsteps with a career in the armed forces. 
The shift from science to the military wasn't exactly a shocking change, given his upbringing. But it did seem surprising at the time. Eric had always been more brains than brawn and proud of it. At 5'10", he was still a slim guy with a round baby face and an upturned nose. He didn't quite fit the image of a soldier. That didn't hold him back too much, though. Eric was easily drawn to the more intellectual pursuits in the armed services. He started taking classes to become a military policeman, or MP. By his sophomore year, he'd changed his major from chemistry to criminal justice. In just a few short years, Eric was well on his way to his new goal. He graduated college with a B average and earned many commendations from his ROTC instructors. After graduation, he attended an army camp where he made the commandant's list. With all these accolades, Eric probably figured his army career was set in stone. Instead, he watched as friend after friend was called up and enlisted, but his call never came. Everyone expected him to be crushed, but as usual, Eric showed no emotion at all. He seemed so nonchalant about the whole thing. Some wondered if he really wanted to be in the army in the first place. Even if he'd never be an MP, Eric was determined to work in law enforcement and was hired as a police officer in a suburb of Fort Worth. He was still a shy and awkward guy, but he got along fine with most of his colleagues. That was until things didn't go his way. Eight months into working there, Eric enrolled to take a class, yet his request for time off was denied. Undeterred, he simply called in sick and went anyway. The next time he was at the station, the chief called Eric into his office. Someone had ratted him out. The chief wanted to know why Eric felt he could ignore his orders. The answer was pretty simple. He'd done it because he wanted to. The consequence was similarly straightforward. Eric was fired. But he didn't stay down for long. A good friend of his, Paul Lilly, was an officer in nearby Springtown. There, he put in a good word for Eric with the chief, James Lyons. Though it had been 10 years, Lyons still remembered Eric Williams from his Eagle Scout review board interview. He had the same dead eyes and the same frozen face, unmoving as a statue. Lyons didn't love the idea of that guy being an officer in his precinct, but everyone else seemed to like Eric just fine. So Lyons told himself he was being too harsh and hired him. The chief would regret not listening to his gut. Not long after Eric was hired, Lyons was woken up in the middle of the night by a call from the dispatcher. Someone had hacked into the most secure level of the station system. The next morning, an IT worker was able to show Lyons it had been Eric. He'd gone into the system and changed the patrol log to give himself more hours. When Lyons confronted him, Eric denied everything. Lyons showed him the proof, but Eric simply stared back at him. The same creeping feeling from all those years ago came back to Lyons as he looked into Eric's eyes. It was like staring at a mask, an empty shell with no trace of humanity inside. It was chilling to see how easy it was for Eric to lie without any sign of guilt. Eric returned the chief's searching stare, making no move to explain himself. He knew Lyons didn't have a clue what he was talking about, and who was he to tell Eric what he could or couldn't do anyway? It's possible Eric thought he could wait it out. Perhaps he didn't believe the old man had the guts to really do anything about the situation. The two were locked in a standoff, and all anyone could do was wait to see who would make the first move. Coming up, Eric's future goes from bright to blurry. 
life after college wasn't easy for 26-year-old Eric Williams. His law enforcement career was on the chopping block for the second time. Springtown Police Chief James Lyons had been hesitant to hire Eric in the first place. Clearly, he'd been right. Eric could not be trusted, and Lyons couldn't have someone like that on his force. The day after he hacked into the police computer system, Eric was fired for a second time. He was starting to feel like people in his hometown had it out for him. He needed a fresh start, somewhere no one knew him, somewhere he wouldn't be limited by the simple minds around him. As it happened, his friend, Paul Lilly, who had gotten Eric the job in Springtown, received an offer to work for the sheriff in a small town in Kaufman County. And he invited Eric to move with him. In 1993, Eric and Paul moved to Kaufman County. It was just the restart he needed. Located on the opposite side of Dallas from his hometown of Azel, Kaufman County was still familiar. It was rural, made up of small towns just like the one Eric had grown up in. Meanwhile, in the city of Kaufman, Judge Glenn Ashworth's longtime coordinator had just died from cancer. He had just started his search for a replacement when a mutual friend recommended Eric. Ashworth was immediately impressed with his resume. The job seemed perfect to Eric, who had been thinking about applying to law school. As court coordinator, he'd be the judge's right hand. Duties included everything from setting trial dates and helping lawyers file motions to managing the judge's office. Seeing a bit of himself in the quiet young man before him, Ashworth gave Eric the position and took him under his wing. Soon, Eric was walking the halls of power in Kaufman County. Ashworth's connections and influence became his. But he wanted more. In his off time, Eric studied for the LSAT. He ended up scoring 163 out of 170, a result that earned him membership in Mensa. Eric paid for a lifetime membership to the High IQ Society and displayed his certificate proudly. Though he hardly needed it, Eric craved validation that put him above those around him. Eric started law school in the fall of 1995 at Texas Wesleyan. He had the full support of his boss and mentor, who let him leave work early to make the two-hour commute to the Fort Worth campus. At last, Eric's life was back on track. School was going well, he had a prestigious job, and was cultivating a good reputation in Kaufman. Yet, even with all the success, something was missing. Though Eric's social skills had always left something to be desired, he had dated in the past. But the relationships were never serious, and most didn't last long. By 1996, Eric was 29 and ready to change all of that, especially once he met 30-year-old Kim Johnson. The two connected in a message board online. They were both former marching band geeks. Kim had even considered law school herself. Working for an attorney made her realize she didn't have the stuff for a legal career, however. She hated confrontation. This was likely the case because her childhood had been full of it. Kim's father had a brutal temper. She regularly hid in closets or under tables to escape his wrath. Her siblings weren't so lucky and received regular beatings. Due to her guilt over being the one who got away, Kim developed bulimia in high school. She saw it as a way to punish herself for not being her father's target, but no one would have guessed what she was going through at the time. She got good at hiding her suffering. Friends at school only knew her as the spunky girl with a smile as big as her hair. Her bubbly, talkative personality suited early internet chat rooms and message boards. When she saw Eric's post on a board for people looking for friends, Kim couldn't help but reach out. They emailed for months, slowly growing to admire each other's intelligence. When they found out they were only 40 miles apart, 
they decided to meet in person. The conversation was easy, and Kim couldn't deny he was good company. She just didn't feel the spark. Eric, however, was immediately smitten. Kim was obviously beautiful, but he was more attracted to her mind, and he was not going to give up easily. He continued to call and email. Mostly, he pushed to keep seeing her. He wore her down more than he wooed her. Eventually, Kim came around. The guys she dated were usually better looking than Eric, but he was so much smarter, and he obviously liked her a lot. She started to see him as cute in his own way. The relationship took some convincing, but once it started, things moved at lightning speed. Kim invited Eric and his family to her house for Thanksgiving. Her parents were plenty impressed by Eric. His family, on the other hand, thought he could do better. Eric's mom said Kim was different, a diplomatically Southern way of saying that Kim was flighty and maybe a little stuck up. His sister Tara thought she was an airhead. But when Eric wanted something, he'd do anything to get it. The relationship deepened and within two years, the couple were engaged. But they didn't share the news with their families. In the spring of 1998, Eric's courthouse colleagues, including Judge Ashworth, threw them an engagement party. That May, the pair flew to Las Vegas, Nevada and eloped. Then, life took a detour on its way toward happily ever after. Just nine months into their marriage, Kim noticed a strange bruise on her thigh. Rather than healing, it seemed to be getting harder. A doctor diagnosed the 32-year-old with rheumatoid arthritis. She was prescribed opioid painkillers to manage her discomfort. Though this was concerning news, Eric remained supportive, for a time, life went on as it had before. Soon, another major milestone was fast approaching. Eric graduated from law school with the class of 1999. After passing the bar exam, he started practicing law for real. He'd no longer be watching from the sidelines as a lowly coordinator, but he didn't want to start from the bottom like most newbies. Luckily, Judge Ashworth was more than willing to help. Ashworth was in charge of doling out county paid assignments. As his protege, Eric was high on his list of favorites. It didn't take long for Eric's schedule to fill with cases and clients. Eric's preferred cases involved child protective services, in which he'd be named guardian ad litem and represent children in custody disputes or abuse cases. Kim couldn't have been prouder of her husband. She saw his work with CPS as heroic and often told him so. He didn't disagree. Kim thought of him as the children's champion, and Eric was more than willing to lean into the praise. He wasn't drawn to the work purely out of the goodness of his heart. Eric liked how much control he had in those settings. As the legal guardian, his opinion could decide the outcome of the entire proceeding. Soon, Eric became the go-to guy for nearly all the court-appointed CPS cases in Kaufman. And it paid pretty well, too. He bought his new wife a three-bedroom home in a swanky new development. It was known around Kaufman as Snob Hill. The rest of his money was used to satisfy his inner technophile. His office was filled with all the latest gear, brand new desktops, laptops, and premium access to Wi-Fi. The more Eric made, the more he spent. By the early 2000s, Amazon and eBay made online shopping the hot new thing, and Eric took full advantage. There were packages arriving at the Williams home practically every day. Kim didn't love how he blew through the funds, but Eric didn't care. In addition to tech gadgets, Eric loved purchasing guns. It was hardly an unusual hobby in Texas. 
Still, a few co-workers whispered among themselves about his ever-growing arsenal of firearms. There was even a rumor he kept a closet full of them in his office. It was starting to seem a bit much, even to them. There's been a fair amount of research into the relationship between impulse control issues and narcissistic tendencies. In 2007, psychologist Dr. Paul Rose specifically studied the link between narcissism and compulsive spending. He found a positive association between the two. This suggests that people with narcissistic personality disorder tend to have a relationship with compulsive spending. For Eric, it was nearly impossible to say no to himself. Though others might have seen this as a problem, he certainly didn't. He couldn't see a reason why he should be denied anything, especially since he was working so hard. But while his star rose, Kim's health continued to worsen. In addition to her rheumatoid arthritis, she was diagnosed with Sjogren's syndrome. This meant her body had a hard time producing moisture. In addition to uncomfortably dry eyes, the condition wreaked havoc on her teeth. Worse, it also aggravated the painful symptoms of her RA. In response, doctors put her on more opioids. Since her original RA diagnosis, Kim had continued working, but as time went on, it became increasingly difficult. Eric had been encouraging her to apply for disability for years. In 2001, she finally gave in. Quitting her job meant Kim was suddenly spending a lot of time at home. Some mornings, she could barely manage getting out of bed. She might have felt like a doorman, signing for Eric's steady stream of packages all day. She started to see more of the delivery men than her own husband. This alienating behavior showed a new side of Eric. Even though he was working and going to law school when they'd first met, he'd always made time for her. But now his career was all-consuming. She wondered if this was just what marriage was like. Kim was constantly learning new things about her husband. For instance, he had an impressive ability to hold a grudge, and no one was safe from it. An incident with Eric's former mentor really drove the point home. In 2003, Judge Ashworth retired. As a Democrat in a conservative area, he didn't like his chances in the upcoming election. Still, he continued working in the region as a visiting judge. One afternoon, Ashworth ran into Eric in the Kaufman County Courthouse. Eric was filling out some paperwork. Among the stacks, Ashworth noticed some blank pay vouchers. Not an unusual thing for a court-appointed lawyer to carry. But these were already signed by the judge who'd replaced him. They were the equivalent of a blank check from the county. Ashworth couldn't believe Eric was up to such shady business and told him so. Eric was irate. On the surface, though, he carried on as if nothing about the relationship had changed. Kim was the only one who knew the truth. Around the house, Eric would constantly disparage the man who'd once been like a father figure to him. The man who'd all but handed him his career. Now, Eric seemed to have shut off whatever fond feelings had once been there, calling Ashworth a, quote, Chrissy prima donna. Kim was shocked at how quickly Eric threw away years of friendship. It was finally clicking. Once you were on Eric's bad side, there was no way out. This was particularly bad news for Kim. Over the years, she'd started taking more and more of the painkillers her doctors prescribed. Her poor health had robbed her of all personality. Her once voluminous hair was thinning. She spent days in bed, hardly ever leaving the house anymore. She was a far cry from the woman Eric had fought so hard to earn. Her unhappiness started to drag him down too. This wasn't what he signed up for, 
and he was running out of patience. The clock was ticking. Coming up, tension rises at home. Now, back to the story. By 2005, 38-year-old Eric and 39-year-old Kim Williams had been married for seven years. Due to Kim's health issues and heavy opioid usage, neither of them had been happy together for a while. The relationship eventually got so strained he dreaded going home. So, he didn't. He kept longer and longer hours at work, sometimes sending emails as late as midnight. His secretary had seen him sleeping on the couch in his office. She knew he stayed late even if he wasn't working. And then, the moment Kim dreaded most finally came. Eric announced he wanted a divorce. She begged him to reconsider, crying that she still loved him. He couldn't just leave her, knowing how sick she was. She hoped he couldn't be so cruel. Divorce would have truly destroyed Kim. Eric was one of the few people left in her life, not including her parents. The more distant he became, the tighter she clung. The dynamic was terribly toxic, but Eric was Kim's entire world. Although he demonstrated that he had no problem cutting people out of his life, something made him change his mind about Kim. Even so, the marriage continued to deteriorate. Few people knew how bad Eric's home life truly was, but Sandra Harwood did. She was an attorney for the state who worked with Eric on many of his CPS cases. More often than not, his late night emails went to her. In them, he vented all his anger and frustrations. Sandra kept these emails to herself, mostly at Eric's request, as if she was his therapist. In addition to the marital problems, Eric regularly railed against other lawyers, especially those opposing him in court. In no uncertain terms, he threatened any and everyone he disliked with heinous acts of violence. In one email, he said he had no problem, quote, sending the opposing lawyer to the hospital with severed vertebrae and removing his children's organs. Shockingly, Sandra wasn't that worried or upset by the messages. She'd been receiving them for years. She had no doubt that Eric was all bark, no bite. In person, he was quiet and polite, even to the targets of his wrath. What did concern her was his attitude in CPS cases. He'd been the top dog in Kaufman County for nearly a decade. People had been bowing to his expertise for so long, he became incapable of compromise. There was only his way. Everyone else was wrong. As working with him became increasingly difficult, folks finally started to notice exactly how much money Eric was making off the county. In 2008, he was one of the top earning lawyers in the area off of CPS work alone. The district court judges for precinct set in Compass Kaufman County appointed Judge Early Wiley to take a look at where the money was going. Reviewing the billing, Wiley found that nearly all of it funneled directly to Eric Williams. Something seemed fishy about his invoices, so she requested a meeting. Though Judge Wiley wasn't directly accusing him of anything, the implication was that he had been padding his hours. Eric left the meeting defensive and angry. Later that day, he called Wiley's assistant to say he wouldn't accept any more CPS cases. The judge recognized the move for the tantrum it was and refused to reward it. Rather than beg him to reconsider, she simply removed Eric from the list of available attorneys. Eric was still fuming when he got home that evening. He told Kim that Wiley had it out for him, so he was going to stop taking CPS cases. Always on his side, Kim was full of righteous anger on her husband's behalf. She might have relished these opportunities to be on the same side for once, when it felt like it was them against the world. 
while the couple stewed on the supposed injustice. It turned out Kaufman County had plenty of attorneys ready and willing to take CPS cases. If he thought he was making a power move by refusing to play ball, Eric was sorely mistaken. It only took six months for him to come crawling back to Judge Wiley, requesting to once again receive CPS assignments. But his days of reaping all the bounty were long gone. This might be why Eric started looking toward the next rung on the legal ladder. There was an election coming up for Justice of the Peace, and Eric intended to run. Kim didn't think it was a good idea. He had never been good with people. The whole thing made her nervous. As usual, Eric ignored her and filed anyway. He was the only Republican on the ticket, so the primary was just a formality. When it came time to campaign for real, Eric told Kim she was off the hook. He didn't expect her to join him on the trail. Truthfully, Kim couldn't have helped him if she wanted to. She was on serious pain medication for her rheumatoid arthritis, including liquid morphine. Leaving the house took monumental effort, and she only did it to help take care of her parents. Her world had truly shrunk. Not only was Eric one of the only people in her life, he was the most important. But no matter how she tried to hold on, he grew more distant by the day. Even when they were both home, the couple lived completely separate lives, rarely looking up from their laptop screens. Kim turned to the internet for the connection she couldn't get at home. She spent a good portion of her days playing games and chatting to friends on Facebook. The hours she spent online slowly ticked upward. For intensely isolated people like Kim, the internet can be a safe harbor. In a 2017 study, Dr. Anna Estevez found a strong association between increased online activity and emotional dependency. A person who is emotionally dependent relies on other people, usually partners, to manage their feelings and prop up their self-worth. This type of person is also prone to do whatever it takes to keep a relationship going, even if it's bad for them. Whether it was joining in on his rage or setting aside her own needs, Kim would do anything to keep her marriage going. Her entire sense of self revolved around it. So eventually, Kim got on board with Eric's election plans. And as expected for most of 2010, he was consumed by the race. Most people thought he didn't stand a chance the incumbent might have been the only Democrat still in office in Kaufman County, but he was well-liked. That wasn't enough to deter Eric, however. In his mind, the victory was already his. And to everyone's surprise, he pulled it off. That November, Eric won the election. A few months later, in January of 2011, he was sworn in. Kim got her hair done for the occasion, looking better than she had in years. Her previous reservations were gone. She proudly held the Bible below Eric's left hand as he recited his oath. Eric was on top of the world. He was officially a judge, something he'd dreamed about since law school. The local Republican Party was impressed that he'd unseated a Democrat, securing him a position as an up-and-comer in their eyes. It could certainly have been just the beginning of his political career. For his part, Eric relished the position. He made sure folks referred to him as Judge Williams, even colleagues he'd been working with for years. Fellow attorneys warned each other that he'd developed a bad case of black robe syndrome, but Eric never cared what other people thought. As judge, he knew exactly what he wanted for his domain. His first priority was to bring the county's technology into the 21st century. And he didn't always care to go through the proper channels to do it. He and the other lawyers had been complaining for years about the lack of Wi-Fi at the courthouse. As manager of the law library for the Bar Association Board, 
Eric had installed a router two years earlier, but the signal was weak and limited to that one room. Rather than contacting the IT department, Eric took it upon himself to price service for the entire building. With the law library's funds, he had more than enough to cover it. The IT guys had been dragging their feet about it for too long. But when a representative from AT&T showed up to install the service, the head of IT was furious. He went to Eric and all but told him to back off. Eric said he would, but he was clearly angry too. Things at the county level moved at a glacial pace. In addition to getting Wi-Fi at the courthouse, there had been talk for years about setting up video magistration. Eric was especially excited about the idea. If he and the other judges could call into the county jails, his job would involve significantly less travel. Though he'd gotten the other JPs and even a district judge on his side, nothing else happened with the plan. Instead, there was miles of frustrating red tape to go through first. With Eric's video conferencing plan stalled, Lori Freemel, who worked in the IT office, was doing inventory of some new computer monitors. The stack seemed shorter than it had been before the weekend. When she checked the records, she realized three were missing. When she checked security footage from the weekend, she was floored by what she saw. There, in black and white, she watched the new JP, Eric Williams, walk out of the department with the missing monitors. She'd figured there had to be an explanation. Days later, Lori found herself in Eric's office to help with an internet issue. There on his desk was a brand new monitor and he said nothing about it to her. The news quickly went up the Kaufman County flagpole. Before long, it reached the newly elected district attorney, Mike McClelland, he had just run on a promise to seek out corruption and keep a clean house. And the man on the video had openly supported Mike's opponent. Along with his chief prosecutor, Mark Hasse, the DA was ready to move on the case. They got two warrants signed by a district judge, one to search Eric's office and vehicle, the other for his arrest. On May 24th, 2011, three sheriff's deputies barged into Eric's office. When they read the warrant, he was sure they were messing with him. But none of the men smiled. Slowly, it dawned on Eric what was happening. The cold metal cuffs chafed his wrists as he was marched through the halls of his courthouse like a common criminal. On the outside, Eric maintained his usual stoic appearance, he showed no emotion as he was paraded past his co-workers. But inside, a fury like he'd never felt raged like a wildfire. The DA and chief prosecutor could never have predicted the chain of events they'd just set in motion. A dark storm was brewing on the Texas horizon, promising chaos, violence, and tragedy. By the end of things, all three men, Eric Williams, Mike McClelland, and Mark Hasse, would lose everything. <laughs>